All right, so we're in Atlanta. Is Dr. Bradbury here? Where is he at? Oh, he's supposed to be here. Dang. There's an old Wayne Gretzky quote that I love. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. So we're going to talk about where the puck's going and what surgeons really want. What surgeons really want is it easier, faster, and better. And that's what we have to deliver at our ASCs. Easier, faster, better. Alfred North Whitehead said, civilization advanced by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. Christoph, this is perfect. It's automation. It's what we really crave, right? Smarter, faster, better, right? That smarter part happens before we enter the operating room. Before we enter the operating room. We want to think less in our operating room. Aircraft one performs a split S? That's the last thing you should do. The MiG's right on your tail. Freeze there, please. The MiG has you in his gun sight. What were you thinking at this point? You don't have time to think up there. If you think, you're dead. Well, that's a big gamble with a $30 million plane, Lieutenant. Sorry, it dates me that I put the first Top Gun on this, but um, <laughs> the point of that was to tell you that in surgery, it is not a place to think. We should not be thinking, and I know that's counterintuitive. So I'm going to show you probably the most uh, famous shot of all time, and I want you to think about how much Michael Jordan was thinking when he performed the shot. Zellers has Jordan. Jordan with two seconds to go. Puts it up. So I'm going to reverse it back 30 seconds before that shot. And this is when Michael Jordan is thinking. Chicago, During the timeout, time now has only that's his only 20. time to think. The that's you as a surgeon seconds. is your only time to think is before that surgery actually starts. Because once the game yep. starts, everything slows down. Will The reason why Michael Jordan made that shot is because why? He's done it 10,000 times before. He's not thinking during that moment. It's all automatic for him, okay? This is a great book. I'm gonna show you several books you gotta read. Deep Work is another great book you gotta read. And my question to you is how much deep work do we do in the OR? Deep work is a state of peak concentration. How much peak concentration do we have? Well, let me show you what we do. Hard to say that this is really peak work, right? Peak concentration, right? Now, I'm not saying you don't focus. We are laser focused when we operate. Different, different. And Christoph showed that in his last lecture, right? Awesome studies, right? Am I thinking when we do these things? Are we thinking at all? This is me in the, this is from my bathroom. This is what I have to do. How much thinking do I have to do for this in the morning? How much thinking do you do? And you guys and girls think about this. Girls may have to think about it a little bit more. Is that sexist or no? Probably not. But each of these things, how much am I thinking? This is automatic, right? That's what it needs to be for your OR. This needs to be automatic like brushing your teeth like taking your vitamins. Consistency is what we're trying to deliver for our surgeons in our ASC, because the best shooters shoot at the exact same time every time they look at the basket, the exact same way, right? That consistency. Now, this idea of task switching, I think, is going to be very important. And I want you to think about this the next time you operate, how much task switching you do in one case. What's task switching? You say, well, you have to stop. Do one thing, stop, think about it, do the next thing. That's task switching. So when you think about one total hip that you're doing, how many times do you switch what you're doing to do something else? How many times do you get interrupted by something, by a nurse, by a circulator that doesn't hand you something, by someone that calls out something, something drops in the OR, something does this, something does that, and it takes away from our concentration just for a second, right? That's task switching. If I throw in thinking in this, if I'm like, ah, what I should I put that cup at today? Gosh, do I really need to worry about pelvic tilt? If you're starting to think about that in the OR, that's trouble. You need to figure out pelvic tilt well before that case starts, right? That's task switching. 
if there's task switching, it creates pain. So we want to be faster. And unfortunately, this is our life, right? We're stuck in waiting rooms waiting for the next case. It's brutal, right? And that's definitely our number one frustration is this. Because we're stuck in these environments that frankly haven't changed in 100 years. It's brutal. We're still using whiteboards. Who's using a whiteboard? I mean, most of you are still stuck in whiteboards, right? In fact, you have the EMRs there, but nobody looks at them. They're looking at whiteboards. What the heck? Can you imagine if Delta ran on a whiteboard? What the freak would happen, you know? It's no wonder, right? So our fundamental goal here in Atlanta was to fundamentally change how our OR functions. That was our goal, right? And the first thing to realize is your OR is a factory, period, end of story. That may offend some of you who think you're doctors and are better than all that. But the pure fact is that we're factory workers and there's assembly lines. And our patients are products on our assembly line. They are. We can love them. We can love our product. And we do. But they're nothing more than on our assembly line. And the key with the assembly line is we have to put these individual parts together in a specific order. And what is the end result of this? What did Henry Ford figure out? What did a lot of companies figure out? The end result is lower cost, higher quality, more reliable products, period, end of story, right? Higher quality, more reliable for our patients. That's what's most important. So we brought simple manufacturing principles to the OR, aggregation of marginal gains, and that, by that we mean we look at each one of our processes and break them down into the individual actions. Individual processes, breaking them down, improve over time by incrementally improving them. My favorite quote, by small and simple things, our great things come to pass. Individual actions in your operating room yield big results. So one that Ryan just brought up, which radical time transparency is very important. By that it means, if you make time transparent in your OR, it becomes radical because it can make change. So time is valued by your teams. Time can be personal. So each surgeon, each staff member knows what their times are. If you don't know how long it takes you to do a total hip, it's because you really don't want to know. If you don't know how long it takes for your assistant or PA or mid-level to close, it's because you haven't taken control of your OR well enough to know that. Time has to be personal, it has to be relevant to you, and it has to be visible in the OR. This is the case we did. We have time visible in our OR just showing each step in the procedure. Time has to be relevant for turnover, right? So it's when, start, when the wound is closed and it ends when the, when the next incision occurs, right? Monitoring time is so important for us. Opening time, all the rest. Drum buffer rope theory. If you look around your OR, you are going to be amazed at how many time thieves there are. It is frightening to you, right? A lot of you choose to wait in the, in the doctor's lounge because you can't bear to watch it, <laughs> right? Because it's so painful, right? And you've given up the fight. You've just given up, right? Um, Let's keep going here. Parallel processes are very important, right? And by that I mean things are not happening in series. There's so many events that can happen in your OR that can happen all together all at once. That's where you're going to catch a lot of time. And you're going to have to spot these efficiencies. So this is not something we directed. This is something we started noticing. And that is one of our uh, anesthetists started doing this, putting this, all that nice stuff that we see all the time, on the patient in pre-op. Why does that make such a big difference? Remember, small and simple things. Why does that make a difference? Because when we bring that patient in the operating room, we push them onto the OR bed in like seven seconds. It's not three minutes of take all the cords off, move everything, okay, let's get someone to help push the, push the stretcher, none of that stuff, right? The small and simple things in your OR are gonna make the big difference. So you have to spot them and you have to look for them. So we started out in the hospital. We were doing 10 by three and then 10 by two and then 12 by two and then 12 by one. And then over a period of time, your OR suddenly becomes more and more and more efficient to the point where it gets ridiculous how efficient you can become. 
just like that, back in the OR doing what I love. Now, I'm operating more than ever. Hey Doc, you think I can be part of the team? So, what a corny video we made. But the point is this, right? We're all happy to be a part of this darn team. Right, when people come to visit, they're like, oh my gosh, what the heck happened to all your staff? How much do you pay them? And the secret is we don't. I mean, we pay them, but <laughs> I have to pay them, right? Time to refuel and change tires. So this is your Lumor OR himself changes the tire. today. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work. This is what it can be. It's a great analogy, and it is so true. It is just so true. So you've read that book. And ASCs is obviously the easiest way to get it done. It is such a pain in the you-know-what to do it in a hospital. It's hard. You can do it, but you're going to have to have 8,000 meetings and meet with 10,000 people. It can be done, but it's hard. So that's why it is. And I'm going to be in stark, uh, stark distinctions from uh, previous talks on where I think we're going to go with ASCs. And it's different than what was just presented. And you have to go back to Adam Smith to appreciate this. And that is specialization. We know what's happened for surgeons, right? We as surgeons have become more specialized. We're not general surgeons anymore. We're orthopedic surgeons. We're not orthopedic surgeons anymore. We're joint surgeons. And Joel and others are just hip surgeons. We have become more and more and more specialized. Now Christoph just does right hips <laughs> in his second OR, right? This specialization is going to carry on to where we operate. You can be as specialized as you want to be, but if you're working with an OBGYN scrub tech, it doesn't matter. It still sucks. You see the difference? If you're in a hospital that's not specialized to fit your specialization, it still sucks, and it sucks operating there, and that has to change, right? So this idea of specialization coming from community hospitals to multi-specialty ASCs, which was great, at least we got out of the hospital. And then it became orthopedic ASCs, where we did a little bit of everything. And sooner or later, it's going to be just joint factories. We don't have hand surgery. We don't have foot surgery. I don't have cardiologists. I don't want a cardiologist in my ASC. What, are you kidding me? I don't give two craps about a, the heart. Because I know my scrub tech that they have to work with a cardiologist means they're not as good if they just do joints. Does that make sense? Outcomes, efficiency, value increases. The quicker you get to this kind of model, I promise you the happier you will be. The happier you will be. Christoph talked about happiness for surgeons, right? You have to break down any walls that are in your way to make it happen. SBD is another one. We have to figure out SPD. They're broken everywhere. They're broken everywhere and we have to fix that. The logistics I think is something that's gonna be very important. You cannot be efficient if your SPD sucks. You can't, there is no way. And if you just look, spend five minutes thinking about what all these OEMs do, think about the crazy logistics to get that case ready for you, the cost it takes to do it, we as surgeons have to start taking ownership from that. You heard Rob Cohen talking about that yesterday with um, revision surgeries and the cost that they have to endure. Guys, we're going to have to start figuring this out in order to make this work, right? Innovator's Dilemma, second book you got to read. And what Clayton Christensen realized was that all these fantastic Fortune 500 companies were dying, they were going away, and he said, this doesn't make sense. There are smart people in these companies. What is happening? You know, 52% of them are gone. The average lifespan of these companies going down. What's happening? What used to grow bright now goes away, and what happened to that? It's the innovator's dilemma. And the innovator's dilemma is all those companies you see on the screen here eventually died. Why did they die? because they didn't understand the job that had to be done. Anybody know where this is? Anybody know what lake? Where's Joel? Joel's been to Finland. This is the Nokia River, and this is in 1865, and they formed this company, Nokia, and they uh, developed paper, eventually rubber, 
and they pivoted. Telecommunications, eventually they gave us these fantastic phones. And in 2007, this is what it looked like. A lot of you will remember. And this was the cell phone. Hello? Hello, Neo. Remember that ringtone? So that was a Nokia. And in 2007, they were the cell phone kings. And this was their market share in the second quarter. They reached 50% of the market. Now, whatever, what else happened in 2007? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. So everyone look in their pockets and Today, see who's got a Nokia phone. Why is that? It's because Apple understood the job of the customer. And your ASCs that you're building and that you're building, you have to understand what the job of the customer is. Your customer is your surgeon, and you have to make it easier, faster, and better for your surgeons. That's the environment we want to create with ASCs, and we know the history here. Jobs to be done to theory works. What it is the customer is trying to accomplish? What's the job that the customer is trying to get done? So that's the most important thing, and we have to remember that we want to make this easier for surgeons. We want to make it faster, and we want to make it better. And I'm going to close with this. This is my last book, probably the most important one. It's How You Measure Your Life. And this is the same guy who came up with these theories and is, he has a very same theory on how you're going to measure your life when it's all over. So I'll ask you, how will you measure your life? Is it going to be the number of surgeries you do? Could be. Could be. Is it going to be your family? What is it going to be? How will you measure your life, right? We all look at our lives and think, well, I was a success, I was not a success, I had a company, I sold it, I made lots of money, or whatever it is, but how will you measure Actually, your life? Actually, really important that you succeed at what you're succeeding at, but that isn't going to be the measure of your life. God doesn't count. He doesn't aggregate, and uh, he's just going to assess you on the basis of how well you helped other people be better people. Thank you.